for coming. Okay, I'm David Duncan, and uh, I work with all, a lot of other people on the cloud uh, distribution uh, or addition. And, the, and the, uh, the, the focus of the cloud addition has been um, one of those things that uh, in the past was a, um, uh, was kind of slipping behind because we had Atomic. Um, I have the jacket over here, Atomic for a long time. And then uh, we thought uh, that OS tree would just really kind of just replace everything. And I think, you know, our, our five-year plan uh, includes the immutable OS as, as a, a, a big part of that uh, cloud initiative. Obviously, that's the foundation for OpenShift. There's no way to get around that. That said, I talk, I work for Amazon, um, if you didn't know. And uh, my role is to talk to customers who are using um, partner Linux and uh, Linux-based solutions on top of cloud, uh, cloud architecture. And so I hear about what's going on, um, what, their, what their pain points are, what the things are that they, they uh, want to have at their at their fingertips beyond just uh, the their uh, modernization models right a lot of them have uh, solutions like SAP that run for you know upwards of 30 years and their their expectation is that they'll have a consistent experience for the duration of that time um, modernization doesn't really we don't we don't talk about modernization in terms of decades Right, <laughs> not at this point. <laughs> we talk about servers as a as a uh, you know in terms of decades, and we're just you know we're just starting to talk about uh, our um, our cloud solutions in ways that operate predictably. And so I I pride myself and and I pride the work that my team does on building um, solid support for. Um, for Linux and Linux-based configurations on top of the cloud, right? Um, or as Peter would say, maybe somebody else's computer. <laughs> uh, the, um, the, the fun thing about that is that I have uh, learned a lot of the paradigms and learning a lot of those paradigms made it uh, uh, just a, a, made me a ready fit for uh, the Fedora experience and the cloud as it was, and the cloud team as uh, Dusty May was turning his focus towards Fedora CoreOS after the acquisition of CoreOS, obviously, all bets were off in terms of Atomic. Atomic was, was retired and, uh, and that cloud experience started to accelerate around the CoreOS uh, experience. And I have a great relationship with CoreOS. I love I love to work with the team, and I also enjoy running it for specific solutions. Um, one of my favorites to use uh, CoreOS for is running agent-based step functions on uh, on uh, uh, in cloud environments, and that means you can create an environment that is basically throwaway. You know, just arrives for minutes, produces the ar artifact, and then. Uh, and then is destroyed as a result of uh, some sort of um, state function. Very much enjoy that. But today, I'm here to tell you that we put a lot of time and effort into reigniting cloud as, uh, as an addition. And um, uh, as, a, as a community, this was a really um, unifying experience. It also brought us to a place where uh, we recognized that there were some different goals around cloud than there ever had been before. Uh, one of the things that we talked about a lot was, um, was the, the concepts around uh, what is a cloud image, right? If it's not just exactly the same thing as, as, a, uh, as, a ser you know, as the server image or maybe the workstation image, um, then what really is it? And, some of those questions are answered in the way that we leverage the, the cloud configuration or the, the, the images themselves because they become extremely versatile. Um, we don't just create a raw disk file. Um, we create 
a solution uh, that is kind of a minimalized version where we know that we're using utilities that are consistent with the expectations that customers have or users have really. Um, users have um, in their, uh, just in the, in the breadth of their experience, right? So uh, it doesn't boot differently than other, you know, than it, that on one, uh, one um, platform as it does another. The expectations are, you know, we try to maintain those as consistent. Now, um, we are also trying to work with, with uh, to increase the documentation, and that's another thing that, you know, I, Peter's in the room, and I'm kind of excited about it because we, <laughs> because like I have all these initiatives that that probably land in things that he's governing at this point uh, around cloud, and one of the things we we need desperately is we need help with our documentation and and integrating with the team to to do better documentation. I know you are. I had I, I had someone who committed to it, but then. Uh, he is a volunteer, and so <laughs> we we work on his time, you know, as 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 he as he's available, and then uh, give him as much help as we possibly can. Excellent. <laughs> I am grateful. So so uh, that also puts us in touch with the websites group uh, infrastructure on a fairly frequent basis, and it gives us a lot of initiatives around the other uh, around the cloud providers. Um, for me, you know, the goal with Fedora is to extend that uh, functionality across any provider that, we're, that is willing to work with us, right? And uh, right now, we're putting a lot of time and effort into focusing on uh, Azure and ensuring that Azure works. Um, that has been kind of an up and down kind of experience, but in, the last, uh, in our last release, we've had to make a lot of uh, security modifications. So if you haven't noticed, uh, several of our change proposals that have gone through have been around like disabling support for um, uh, non-tokenized uh, communications with the uh, metadata services, uh, ensuring that we have uh, support for faster network interfaces, and ensuring that we're um, we're getting the right kind of support for uh, for that in the um, in the configuration of the image creation. That said, our image creation is done using a terrible tool. I'm, okay, a wonderful a tool that was wonderful in the time that it was uh, heavily maintained, but we have other we have other options now, and uh, and I think that um, we, as we look to the future, we will see the um, We'll, we'll start to use more Ansible rather than, uh, rather than using um, additional code development for our DevOps. We decided that we would try to build our own collection. So we're sort of uh, working through building a collection that, that, will, um, that will support our uh, requirements for upload into Oracle, into Azure, into um, AEC2, and, and into, um, and, into uh, GCP. And we find that, you know, that, that's really where we want, want to be. Um, so when you think about where cloud belongs, cloud kind of extends out into the experience of the vagrant images. We have uh, um, an expectation that we're going to extend that cloud image into the WSL. Uh, the work that we've done around you, uh, leveraging Kiwi in the context of Koji has given us the option of creating our own WSL image in, uh, that's consistent with the images that we're creating for the other cloud, for the cloud providers. That, that will give us the option of kind of refilling that space. There are other people who are doing a great job of, of re-rolling the cloud, the cloud packages and then placing that in, into, uh, into the WSL uh, directory, but we'd like to have our own. So uh, I guess here we have a packaging strategy that we're just forming. It's, it's, uh, and that is similar to the way that the NeuroFedora team has, has uh, settled into their packaging model. We want to have uh, several packages that are associated with things that are, uh, um, that are central to the cloud providers all sort of centrally located inside of the cloud team. And the reason we want to do this is because 
we don't want any one person to have to be responsible for the packaging model or in, you know enduring you know making things work all by themselves we'd like to have this be a collective where the those those packages that are necessary for say uh, you know the the Google Compute CLI the the AWS CLI um, other other types of tools like the uh, uh, cloud development kits that come from from uh, these groups cloud shell uh, integrations in the desktops we want to make sure that all of those work and function in a way that is consistent and that we have a unified voice in the way that we communicate back with them if you haven't looked at some of those uh, those uh, CLIs or or the um, uh, well I mean anybody who's worked with cloud will probably know that they've been bitten by the uh, by the experience of having a uh, a cloud providers uh, utilities that are based around uh, an earlier version of Python like Python 2.7 um, in the modern world <laughs> and and that uh, that gives us a lot of pain uh, pain points for for trying to integrate and we want to have a unified voice on that uh, other things that we run into is we have uh, cloud providers that will, or, or developers who will constrain the requirements so if they're using a python based cli that python based cli may may be leveraging some you know version of pigments or some other package that is consistently lower than what we're we're producing for uh, fedora and we have to go back in and relax those requirements i mean this is kind of a common thing in a lot of software but but uh, but it's something that we really don't want to do. We want to make sure that we have consistency across the board. Um, and I do this with my, you know, with my, um, in, in my professional life, I do this across, try to do this across the board. But then uh, here in Fedora, you know, this is the unified voice that I want us to have and make sure that we have that uh, as, a, as a group. So that kind of gives you where, where it is that we, we see our strategy and where we see our position. So moving on to that, we also see uh, the, the cloud being very much integral to the workstation experience. Um, obviously, a lot of our testing goes on in, in, a, in a server environment uh, in, or in open QA in ways that is just sort of basic. And uh, we want more advanced configurations. We want to look more at what the boot, boot requirements are. If something fails in, a diff in one of our uh, cloud environments, we really want to take it, you know, take it back to a, a, you know, a, a server that we own or works workstation that we own, and and uh, uh, take it through its paces to determine if there's something that we can we can locate there, just as easily as we can uh, trying to do debug with no serial console. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and uh, I see us as sort of uh, in in line with the Fedora server model. The server model obviously has a lot of things that we don't need. So we don't require DNS. That's a service that's, the, you know, that's expected to be provided. You know, we would maybe provide some sort of an intermediate, uh, faster response. But we won't, we won't provide um, the full-fledged you know, full full -fledged DNS support. We don't need DHCP, obviously, because there is already a DHCP provider. There's no way to get an IP, you know, an IP address on any of the cloud providers without, your, without having your own DHCP assignment. Um, let's not talk about IPv6, though. <laughs> um, and so you know, we try to keep that image minimal. Um, but that said, you know, there are lots of things that we can do. Um, the, one, the IDE that I put on here, and this is this is like a uh, an, an idea that I feel like we we have um, we can f flesh out more, is that uh, most every cloud provider has some IDE model that they're using that is cloud based, similar to the one, uh, or I'm sorry, it's uh, almost web based, right? It's a web based API or interface like Cloud9, and the Cloud9 API sits on top of some instance somewhere. And today, that you know, like the the team that's responsible for it, they're responsible for they they publish instructions on how to make your own, but then they don't actually make make one that is uh, associated with Fedora. So I wholeheartedly believe that that is something that we want to provide for the for our uh, development um, engineers who are working in that space, who are interested in continuing to work in that space, and make sure that they have. Uh, the, a segue or entryway into the Fedora community and our projects um, without having to change what they were doing previously uh, just just in, 
introduce Fedora into their workflow. Um, uh, Kiwi with Koji is one of our big, uh, our big um, uh, pass forward. And the reason for that, uh, so we like OS, OS build and we like the way that it works. We love the way that it functions as a service. It has, very, it has a very clear um, uh, position inside of the community and, and our, our efforts. But right now, there are a lot of things about it that, are, uh, that limit what we can produce, including the WSL images, including container-based images, including images that are associated with uh, Azure in, in the way that uh, are ex that's expected. And so we want to uh, ease our way into what's being done inside of the Fedora community, but we also want to introduce Kiwi because we think it's a very effective tool. It has a great way of layering the uh, configs and we can, we can um, have a composable configuration that we can break down and not be responsible for everything. Um, and that is one of the reasons that we've chosen it as a, as a part of our process. Um, and all of our tools, our current tools are in, are in maintenance phase. Uh, we're producing architectures for ARM and for x86-64, and we have uh, special friends inside of the Red Hat teams who are producing S390X uh, machine images for us, and then reporting back if there's any con inconsistency in the way that those are functioning. Um, so these are the architectures that we're, su we're supporting. Um, I would love, I keep, uh, I keep hounding our, uh, the internal guys at EC2 to give us access to the um, to the Mac instances so that we can, uh, we can try out this Asahi stuff. <clears throat> and uh, we're working on, you know, we want to see as many customized images as we possibly can see. If, there's, if there are things that people need in the context of a specific cloud provider, we want to make sure that we're capable of producing that and that we have in the context of these Kiwi uh, configurations a component, a, a composable component that will allow us to um, make those, my, whatever minor tweak or major tweak that needs to be done for that specific environment. So let's say you have an ARM64 instance and that ARM64 instance requires uh, IOMMU be uh, disabled, right? Because there's no, that, that caching layer is not, not actually there in, the, in the, ARM, the ARM architecture. It's only there in the Intel architecture and Accessing that cache, cache can then add incredible latency to your and context switches to your communications with the with the uh, processor, and we want to make sure that that you know those customized configurations are in fact included inside of those. Um, the agents that are associated with Google uh, Compute Platform versus the agents that are associated with Azure, we want to make sure that those are are specifically uh, addressed. But then we also want to make sure that the, you know we have a generic experience that customers can or users can can uh, um, uh, can can take advantage of in their uh, in their process as well because we don't want them to lose track again we don't want them to lose track of the things that they've already developed and have to move to something different just because they've moved into you know in, into uh, they've decided to use Fedora so that's one of the reasons that. We think Ignition is a great idea, but we don't want to forfeit cloud in it, right? So, um, uh, the package dashboard integration is something that we're working on right now. Um, a few of our, you know, a few of the packages that we're working on, including in that, uh, are the hibernation agents for uh, the EC2 instances, and uh, and then the uh, the uh, Windows agent actually includes that same kind of hibernation. Um, that one tends to be something that you wouldn't want to put anywhere else, right? Because they modify the sleep.sh files and, and modifying the sleep.sh is kind of a no-no anywhere else. Like you wouldn't, it, Peter's not going to do that on server. And, 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 um, and so, you know, we, we have to make a conscious decision that this is something that's going to be beneficial outside of the, outside of the main, uh, you know, our main distribution uh, objectives. Uh, but, that said, like making that decision doesn't mean that we, you know, we immediately 
leave the you know take the cloud cloud provider off the hook. That means that we work with them upstream in the way that Fedora is supposed to, right? Which is we we go back to those service teams and say, guess what? You know, you're modifying something that you should be pushing. You know, the, your modification should be pushed upstream, and people should consider these to be consistent with the way that you're you know you're supposed to handle that. Um, so we want to make sure that we have that uh, that parity. Um, uh, so here's a few things that I I'm, am asking for. Um, we need test plan updates. Like we have lots of things that are not being tested as well as we as we wanted to. Um, we need uh, support for, for our Fedora Cloud test days. Uh, Fedora Cloud, te if you're not familiar with the Cloud test days, these are wonderful things for us to get into, and it's a great place for us to have uh, more automation. So. Some of you guys in here are from the Ansible group, and you may know a little bit more about operation oper or, or automation and, and uh, automation platforms, maybe. But uh, um, we'd love to have your help in ensuring that a lot of those two, those are um, are uh, uh, ready for you know ready for use and ready for testing, and we can get some get a lot of feedback very quickly. Um, ButterFS, if you don't know, is a, an important part of our, our process. And this is something that uh, separates. So you'll see, uh, you'll see uh, the work on Enterprise Linux Next and how that Enterprise Linux Next is kind of deviant from how the Fedora Cloud image looks, right? We have this base of ButterFS similar to the way that Workstation does. And one of the things that we wanted to do here was to create an environment where we could really uh, separate that experimentation and provide a lot more uh, connection back to um, or feedback on things that might be beneficial far in the future or, or you know even closer um, but the but it gives us an opportunity to, to do some of that exploration and one of the things that we want to do that is directly related to um, to, to some of the objectives around uh, in the Red Hat experience is to provide some uh, um, microkernel um, models that uh, people can experiment with. Um, we need, you know, so we need lots of documentation. I've got, I'm short on time, so I'm just going to say that right out loud. Um, these are some of the things that I think would be great for us to have as companion guides and, and to have as, uh, as uh, for more friendly documentation uh, for, each, for each one of the cloud providers. And these are some of the things that we're doing, the Cloud9 Integration. We're looking at doing Neural Fedora uh, as a as a connected way, a connected um, image with the NVIDIA controller drivers already established. A lot of the cloud providers already have distribution rights, and we can produce images, and those images can then have the have the uh, associated in NVIDIA uh, uh, controller drivers in, integrated back in. And then we're also working on the workstation uh, model. So VDI is another thing that we think is really important. Uh, we'd like to do some more of the integration with the um, uh, with the HPC to technologies like Parallel Cluster. Um, we just really want to make things more flexible, more agile, bring more of this opportunity. We have another talk on Thursday about uh, about building your own images and how we build those images. And we really want to take this all the way out, right? Like the, this IoT experience can definitely be brought all the way back into uh, your cloud experience, whether you're running it on top of your server or you're running it on top of, uh, uh, of a cloud provider. So with that, I'll take any questions you have. I appreciate your attention. There's a lot of attention in the room and I appreciate that. Grateful. Any questions? Well, if you find that you have questions, I, you can find us here. I'm here all, all day. <laughs> and uh, uh, always love to talk about it. Um, um, the Cloud Sig meets every other Thursday. Uh, and we meet on an early morning, so it's not a very APEC friendly time zone, you know, time, time frame. Uh, but, uh, happy to move that so that we can we can increase the uh, the amount of participation if if we need to. All right.
Oh. Probably got 20 seconds left. <laughs> Um, no, I was just going to ask, uh, so how did Amazon take your suggestions on how to fix the EC2 um, hibernation agent, you know, to make it more upstream friendly? Honestly, they took it really well. Um, there's a, uh, there's a, a specific engineer who made his first kernel commits uh, because I was collaborating with Dave Chenner on how, the, how we could make it work, and we had run into a bug, and uh, um, it was an NVMe bug associated with, with XFS. And Dave and I were talking back and forth, and I said, you know, this guy, Xiao Yi, is, is working on this, this bug that's associated with, uh, with this. Can you, can you help him get this kernel commit done? And he literally, you know, coached, you know, we, we, the two of us together coached him on, on uh, making the commit, uh, doing the work inside of the uh, LKML. And then Dave uh, took his pat like, there was, you know, obviously this was his first patch, so he took it uh, with, you know, some spacing issues and tab space mixes, which probably wouldn't have happened if he hadn't, they hadn't already had the kind of behind the scenes conversation about what their goals were and, and how to attack it. But it made him a first time, you know, kernel committer. And that to me was like uh, the, you know, experience of a lifetime to say that, you know, this is, this is EC2 hibernated agent and the reason that this, you know, Xiao Yi is working with, with confidence on the kernel is because we had this conversation in the context of Fedora and we had it with the, uh, with the, um, the owners of that, co of that code uh, who also happened to just, just, ha just so happened to work for Red Hat. So cool. Yeah. Well, I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to say that I appreciate everyone coming and, and uh, listening. And if you want to participate, please let me know. And if you want to talk further about uh, what we can do uh, to make, you know, to streamline how I interact with the teams that you work on, really looking forward to doing that. for years the way that we've up done our uploads but image factory really only supports one cloud and if you look at it the code is built around libcloud and libcloud uh, if you haven't if you if you don't have any you know if you don't have uh, cloud experience that goes back to joint right which are the people who who uh, uh, brought us npm <laughs> um, and node node.js they brought us all of that uh, joint uh, was a was a company that uh, that was first on the scene, and Eucalyptus was there, and then LibCloud was built. Uh, I think it was built by Matt Garnett. Matt Garnett was probably was part of the LibCloud team, and and uh, Matt went on to do the Bodo three libraries for for uh, Amazon, and he did those independently, um, and then uh, Amazon said, you know, we'll take over the maintenance for that. We'll we'll bring bring a whole team to it, and. Uh, and that's how the Boto 3 library became Boto 3 and Boto Core and the AWS CLI. Um, but the, uh, uh, but the, the reason we wanted to do an Ansible collection is because LibCloud was one of these things that people used as a result of wanting to do a generic experience, right? They wanted to create a generic experience around it. And LibCloud was built around Eucalyptus and Red Hat had an initiative when Joint was nascent and the concepts around Eucalyptus were, were still called dis distributed computing. And, uh, and they, uh, they had a program called Delta Cloud, which still exists, and LibCloud is a component part of that, of that Delta Cloud initiative. The Delta Cloud, the, all of that is based on 2.7, and of course it fell out of, it, fell out, it, it went into the Apache project and did what things do when they fall into the Apache project. <laughs> and, uh, 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 but they have, I mean, there's still people who are maintaining it, it's great. Uh, the, they're just they're just not making advances on it, right? So uh, and they don't fix a whole lot of the bugs. They just fix the ones that are that, that are critical to whatever it is they're doing. And uh, we our use of it never got beyond uh, the AWS configuration. So uh, we don't have any advanced support. There's clearly no support for the OC for Oracle, you know, cloud cloud infrastructure, uh, and never will be. So we know that we have a mission there, which is to create that, uh, that uh, consistency. And the way that we thought 
was best integrated with the with the way we work is is to uh, leverage Ansible in the same way that infrastructure leverages Ansible, and that way we would have the ability to just push whatever into uh, into that uh, Ansible playbook, and then the Ansible playbook could be responsible for their image creation. There are things inside of, of reg image registration that wouldn't necessarily lend themselves to that in like the Red Hat images because Red Hat images have assigned uh, billing, billing codes and things like that that are kind of hidden behind the scenes and we probably don't want to, like they're not, they're so not useful, they're only useful to like three, three actual uh, us users of that, you know, of the, 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 um, the image registration. So they would never be, it would never be a, um, a prioritized function. Um, but it's something that we can use to build uh, very specifically images that are, that are leveraging the same kind of components that we have, both in the kickstarts and also in the, uh, uh, in the cloud, in the cloud utility, in the image factory that we use today. They integrate really well with Koji, um, makes it, make it super easy for us to do an event-driven architecture once we have a consistent image and that image goes through test. Once the, the test promotion happens, we can automate the, the uh, deployment based on that collection. The collection itself does some things that are not standard, so all the Ansible guys would kind of be like, yeah, that's a nice idea, but you're still taking a lot of requirements for other collections to make this happen. Um, but I think that, I think we have a fairly good foundation for why it is that we're supporting additional collections in there. And, and leveraging collections that have have some support today, right? So, GCP, the Google uh, Google Compute has is a supported configuration for Ansible automation, and uh, and the uh, uh, same with the the AWS, and we have some other things that are coming up in in Azure Office. Um, so that gets us our primaries, and then we can we can leverage uh, some basic you know basic commands for some of the smaller providers like more what they call managed clouds right rather than the public clouds the managed clouds where where we want to make sure that we still have images on the managed clouds too and this makes it possible for us to have more of a collaborative experience around that. so if you're looking at what i think is really important for me what's really important is making sure that we have this kind of distributed architecture that's easy to to drive with uh, event driven uh, experiences around the qa team's um, uh, results Uh, what else would you like to know about the cloud? Um, <coughs> we have, so I'll get more into the cycle, I guess. Um, now that I, I realize I have more time, this is, this is going to be more fun, actually. So one of the things that, uh, is this, um, I got it. F5, nope. Okay, fine. I'll do it from here. Okay, I'm going back. So, uh, I'm going back here to this one. Okay. So this is kind of an exciting part for me, uh, the Fedora Cloud for IDE. Um, the reason that I think that this is, a, this is kind of amazing is it represents a lot of things, ButterFS being one of them, right? This is totally deviant from what you would expect uh, a cloud image, or I'm sorry, an, an image to do, right? Like if you, if you were pulling together a spin right now, you probably wouldn't pull together a Cloud9 spin, right? Um, and the reason for that, uh, that, um, our ability to do that is because we can do a whole lot of this in post, right? So I can do this in ways that are consistent with whoever has the, uh, has the contract, right? So if I look at what happens in a service team at, at uh, Amazon, they're required to use the EC2 image builder, and I can build a document that is just as easily leveraged inside of the EC2 image builder with Ansible that, uh, as I could one that was used, used inside of the Ansible automation hub. And that way, if we have an event-driven architecture or a requirement for building something that has a you know, zero-day exploit, 
we can literally roll that into a golden image pipeline. And the golden image pipeline can be associated with like producing all of those images. And that kind of is something that's really exciting to me. The, the images we, uh, the, the, you know, so if you're looking at that, you, know, you can think about it in terms of like characteristics of, of other uh, service workloads. And my goal is to uh, become uh, consistent with the requirements that Steph Walters has around software as a service. So basically supporting a lot of the work that's being done on top of OpenShift and OKD in, in, the, in the community to identify how we can, we can build uh, software as a service. And one of the ones that, um, and in fact, one of the guys that's on my team at, uh, at Amazon has kind of adopted the concept of doing Pagger as a service. And, and to leverage that as one of our, our ways of producing um, a, a visible support for a, uh, an application on top of, on top of the, uh, both the Fedora Cloud experience and also the, um, the, um, the OpenShift experience. We don't, want to, we don't want to muddy, like from a cloud perspective, I don't want to muddy the experience that customers, you know, that users have around OpenShift and the experience around container-based workloads. I want to enhance that and then where they have specific techniques or, or, uh, or expertise to ensure that they have uh, supplemental models for that. And then to provide these things like the, the cloud, cloud IDE where um, they would not have normally chosen to go to like Eclipse Che to do their work, right? They, they would have already, you know, they would have been tinkering around with Amazon Linux under the hood and, or, or Ubuntu, and they think, that, they think that this is a great fit, but they're really looking towards a RHEL architecture or infrastructure, and they want to know what that RHEL infrastructure is going to look like when they're doing that, uh, doing that configuration. And then we can do things like, because we're having, we have this package maintenance group, we can take the package maintenance for things like the cloud development kits, and then take those cloud development kits back into those IDEs immediately, and then we, we can have sort of a point in time uh, support model, so we know where our support uh, our support exists, and then our customers can understand or our users. <coughs> Sorry, I keep saying customers because they're not customers; they are users, and and uh, our users are are capable of making decisions uh, that qualify their workloads and in, in ways that they were already familiar with. So the strategy is meet them where they where they're living and where their where their technology is is uh, exists. ButterFS again, I'm 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 jumping around a little bit. I'm sorry about that, but but the ButterFS uh, decision we made supports a lot of send receive uh, models for snapshots and snapshotting, and um, <clears throat> obviously we could have chosen a, a much larger file system. Uh, but that's already kind of covered in, the, in a lot of the uh, a lot of the the, the larger uh, cloud providers, uh, like um, e the EFS utilities for for the extended file systems, which uses um, uh, NFS v4 to create parallel parallel uh, um, file storage across multiple availability zones. And we can we can take advantage of those EFS utilities to just mount that up on on the, the instances themselves, and that's leveraged actually in in uh, a lot of the OpenShift configurations, um, based on some of the stuff that we were doing in, in uh, uh, experimental work around Fedora, so uh, Fedora Cloud, and and the ButterFS we we've, we've been looking at ways to um, to modify the. So Kiwi gives us some other flexibility around around ButterFS. It makes it possible for us to to, um, to uh, you know leverage um, techniques that you would have only gotten uh, with LVM as a foundation. But LVM is terrible on on you know in the in the context of the public cloud, not because it's not a, a sound uh, technology, but because the drives themselves are already striped. So anything that you're actually using in NVMe drive, you're not using one. You're using multiples underneath, and the LVM structure doesn't add uh, any ability. Like the the increase and decrease of the volume size is already there, right? You just have to increase and decrease the the file system size. And if you need another uh, partition, 
that partition can take advantage of another EBS volume, and then you don't decrease the I/O performance that you have on the volumes that you know where you need it. So if you're doing something like a var log or, or slash var, and you're la you're you're creating um, a database, and that database is is living inside of that EBS volume, you don't have to sacrifice your operating system uh, performance to in fact use that. One of the things that we can take advantage of with ButterFS is we can we can uh, use the snapshot send and send and receive the, the contents of the current var to the, to the uh, new EBS volume with whatever P, you know, IOPS uh, reservations you have in total. And then that, that can then go back into place on the, on the instance, right? So now I can mount this new EBS volume with all of the content that I had in the, in the original slash var. And that just is a snapshot, so there's no, there's not, uh, there's not a, um, there's not a waiting period. There's just make the send, quiesce the database, new, you know, push it, push the mount, and then, and then you're done. So minimal downtime, we can, we, you know, we can take advantage of a lot of those that flexibility inside of the operating system. We can shrink the operating system, which is one of the other things that we really like. Um, and, and is a big deal, right? Because a lot of people, I mean, I do this. I'm totally guilty of this. I will stand up an instance, build CentOS or Fedora images for, for Marketplace, and then I will shrink the volume. <laughs> and and uh, that means that, you know, I can, have, I can have a 60 gig volume for a few minutes while I create my artifacts, and then I can decrease it down to 20, make a snapshot, that army is is exactly what I need for, for or it has it has all of the content that I need to just make an improvement to the to the base disk, and then uh, shoot that back up to the uh, to the marketplace. A question about you mentioned the Amazon Linux. Uh, it's also a kind of Fedora based. <laughs> it is now, yeah. So, um, uh, well, what, I, is the, what is the, what the, the relation be? Oh, okay, so well, I mean, we work. So I I work with the Amazon Linux team as well. So uh, when we first, so long time ago, this was uh, this was um, the idea of Amazon Linux. Uh, what, what at that point was 2022, and then it became 20. It slipped. <laughs> um, was uh, envisioned by Max Spivak, a, for, a former Fedora project lead, and. Max wrote the documents, um, uh, created the, the vision you know, for what this would look like and how we would do the implementation. And uh, then he got another really great opportunity. He's working at Google now. And, and, uh, uh, he, and so uh, one of the things that, but he left us that legacy, right, of, what, of how Amazon Linux could be associated with the upstream experience uh, in Fedora. And, Originally, the goal was to branch at F35 and to use F35 as a, um, as, a, uh, as a foundation for the first version of Amazon Linux 2022. And the concepts there are twofold. So if you, are you familiar with Amazon Linux? And, and so this is a great, yeah, this is a story that will make, make Peter's hair curl a little bit. This is, Amazon Linux was originally created um, because they wanted to excel. The, the senior senior leadership wanted to accelerate their uh, support for new hardware, um, and then originally they built on Rel five. Right. <clears throat> so if you're familiar with that, Rel four and Rel five were the, were the original foundation for that that whole cloud. Uh, you can thank Matt, Matt Wilson and Christian Gapton and a bunch of other guys like that. Um, <clears throat> the um, but the vision they had was was to move a lot faster. And so their, uh, the options for that were to build their own distribution or to do something that was a little bit derivative. Well, they started to take uh, a lot of what was being done in the CentOS uh, uh, um, team and, and kind of move that into, uh, into, the Amazon, into what they called Amazon Linux. So removing trademarks, doing all the things, focusing on the hardware that they had at hand and the modifications that they did to their hardware. Um, there's lots of things, there's security chips and all sorts of things to keep you from landing in the actual flash RAM, you know, things like that. 
And, uh, and so they wanted to make sure that they had those improvements in place pretty, pretty much immediately. And then they thought, you know what, we can make this available for customers, and customers can use it too, and we'll find out more about it, we'll get more bugs. And we, we all know this story, right? We've all used CentOS. So, um, so the, uh, the goal there was to keep that consistent for customers. And so one year turned into two, turned into three, turned into four, all right? And then there was a PHP, you know, so there's PHP 4, then there's PHP 5, then there's PHP 6, and there's all these customers who are using it, and there's all these people who, you know, this is the, we had the business discussion right earlier, here's the data-driven part of the, uh, the complexity of the data-driven part, is like, but well, we have all these customers who are running PHP, but we need the, P, you know, but they're, but they're running PHP 4, but these customers need to have PHP 5. And so then you started to see this like hodgepodge of things that were, that were there. Something that very similarly ha was happening inside of the Red Hat community. And so you know, that's the birth of modularity right, right there is, is finding that, that experience. Well, we all had the same experience around trying to maintain multiple versions and software collections and, and all of that. And, and, uh, and so Amazon Linux 2 became this really complicated, hard to maintain, way far away from, you know, way, way divergent from uh, where it was originally. And, and so, you know, like compatibility was, an, was, an op, was not an option. And people, but, you know, we still maintained kind of the same, same structure as the CentOS builds and it made it easy to use a lot of the, the real, originally the real 5 stuff and then the real 6 stuff and then real, uh, <coughs> uh, real 7 and then some of the 7 and 8 right around different car, kernel versions. And then, uh, so Amazon Linux became Amazon Linux 2, and Amazon Linux 2 kind of tried to push, push the GCC much farther. And then Amazon Linux 2022 was coming up. Um, and then that structure, uh, they restructured, they reorged, um, you know, COVID hit, things, things happened uh, that uh, impacted lots of, lots of people's uh, um, expectations. And, uh, and that slipped into Amazon Linux 2023. Amazon Linux 2023 ended up, for, uh, I wouldn't call it forking, but, but branching from F36. And there was never any goal, this is one of the things that, that, uh, that, um, that Max set up. Max never had a goal of being 100% uh, AVI compatible with, uh, with Red Hat. His goal was to be 100% focused on customer problems and customer customer experience, and to go through that in the context of uh, what was what was uh, inside of the distribution. That said, that they don't have so uh, you know they have very specific goals around support. Right, they want to support the machine the, the the machines that they have in in their data centers. They want to support the configurations that that are important to the services that are running. <coughs> So that makes it much different than what our goals are in Fedora. My goal in Fedora is to ensure that if there is a, if there is a workflow that we can, you know, we can help a, cust uh, a user uh, integrate, then we want to make sure that, that we're helping them to integrate that in the context of the Fedora experience, right? And leading them into the workflows that we are perfecting, right? So, um, so like where we might have very specific goals around ensuring that we have like a baseline support for um, for ButterFS and for you know other other component parts. That the uh, Amazon Linux team will be focused on what their performance requirements are for EBS volumes, what their uh, what what the Lambda service needs in order to have a, a good foundation for container-based workflow, and they don't care if if like if the package is in. Is if there's an extra Linux, you know, uh, an Apple package that's associated with it, that's not important. That's that's more like that. That's a you, you know, you can go and and bring that, compile it, let us know if there's a problem, right? Um, and they do they do a, a public PFR, just like we do, <laughs> and and, uh, and they uh, they work off of that uh, based on based on a data driven approach, right? They, they prioritize based on customer, customer demand. We prioritize based on where our expertise is and who's working on the project at this point. 
<laughs> like who's dedicated? Yeah. So is that is that a, a? And I think that you know if you looked at if you look at the um, uh, the work that you know that Microsoft did with Flatpak or or um, you know Google's done around Debian, you would find that the, you you know you have the same kind of the same kind of experience. And we've made some really interesting com we've had lots of really interesting conversations. And I can only t I mean I can talk about a lot of the ones around Amazon just because I'm so deeply involved in them, like. Um, like when we were talking to the SDK team and, to, and help you know helping them to understand what our what our problems were and how we could you know how we could help each other. Um, the uh, one of the great like this is another one of these great moments like like getting a um, like having you know someone make their first commit is uh, we were working with. Uh, Kyle Knapp, who is responsible for most of the work that's done on the AWS CLI development, and uh, Tomash Tomajic um, asked if he could be a part of that conversation. And uh, when he started down that road, we started having a very serious discussion around packet. And the packet implementation inside of AWS CLI 2 is the first one. It's like a, it's a, it's the gold standard that. I'm leveraging to talk to other teams about how they can uh, how they can integrate back into that, and you know not just not just Amazon. I mean, that Google talking to Zach and and his team at Google, and talking to uh, David Duffy and his team at, at um, Microsoft to make sure that they understand that we have this we have this consistency model inside of uh, uh, the Fedora the Fedora experience that will give us what we need. Um, in terms of in terms of flexibility and uh, uh, rapid integration, because AWS CLI team like literally they release every day. If you were paying attention, you know, Boto three is out and then out and then out and then out. <laughs> it is painful uh, <clears throat> if you don't have if you don't have a good automated process for dealing with it. And Nicola Copa on on Thomas's Thomas's team is. Uh, Co-maintainer, really primary maintainer, as, as far as I'm concerned, with me on that on that um, on that project. Time now, okay, think. great. <laughs> I'm out of voice too. So <laughs> it's a good time for me to take a rest. <clears throat> awesome. Any other questions? Internationalization, specific technology support, something you're working on, you think we would like to bend the rules on that we can maybe help you? Bend versus Emacs? <coughs> you know I'm an Emacs man, so <laughs> my life is all about Elisp. Um, but, uh, but, you know, Na Nano works, Vim works, <laughs> they're all just an install away. We have, and that's another thing is that uh, the infrastructure team creates packaging for the for the um, for the updates and the, the repos in each one of our individual um, individual standard regions. So, like whenever you're pulling um, whenever you're pulling your updates for Fedora, you're in fact not creating egress charges in the availability zones. You're still pulling from the from the same locations. So you're working in. We use CloudPunch as a foundation for that. Okay. Thank you.